In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of good gifts and giver of life, come and abide in us, cleanse us of all impurity, and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Okay. Weather stuff happens. Welcome to the middle of winter. Um, so I'm recording this episode. There is no one here. It's just me. Um, to keep on with time things uh, and to not have our class drag behind. Um, so we'll see how this goes. I uh, just want to wearing my, my flannel instead of my, my trademark black button down. So we're starting with, we're, we're starting into Moses. And I just want to give a quick recap of Genesis in like a minute. God created everything. He created man in his image. Man fell and served demons. This leads to death. Cain is the first murderer. Demons seduce man into worshiping them by giving them knowledge, by giving them technology, by giving them promises, uh, and giving them things that are going to destroy humanity. Good things, but humanity is not able to use them correctly, and so they destroy them. This leads to the Nephilim, this corruption of mankind, uh, where man is consorting with demons. You get a corrupt world. And that corrupt world, when it comes into contact with God, is destroyed. Um, we can call this death by holiness. Therefore, what happens is in this corrupt world, the flood happens. Creation is kind of reversed and we go from order back to chaos because God withdraws kind of his protection. Um, and then natural consequences happen. Sin brings destruction and chaos. A remnant is uh, preserved and continues on, but they start to build this tower. They start to try and manipulate God, try to bring him down to earth to manipulate him into giving them what they want, to basically treat God like a pagan God, like one of, they treat God like one of these, these Nephilim spirits that's going to give them knowledge and technology in order to preserve humanity from being utterly destroyed, from contact with holiness in a corrupted state, God takes a step back. He kind of withdraws himself from humanity and he places this buffer of the angels and he divides the nations among the sons of God, the angels, and the humans turn to worshiping these spirits and these spirits accept worship and the angels of the nations, these gods of the nations fall and we see this corruption. And so now you have the pagan landscape from there. Abraham is called out of Ur, out of the area of the Tower of Babel, into the Holy Land, and God establishes himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is different from these other gods. Not only because he created them and he's like a fundamentally different thing, but these are gods that have specific lo localizations. He does not. He is the God of people. The God of persons, not the God of places. He brings Joseph and the children of Egypt, or the children of Israel, down to Egypt, and we see here Egypt becomes the paradigm of sinful mankind serving these demonic powers, and that's where we pick up with Moses. There are three major themes that I kind of want you to keep in mind as we talk about this first bit of Moses. We're going to talk about Moses for a few weeks. And I want you to keep three things in mind for tonight. History, revelation, and moral teaching. As far as history, this is God bringing the Israelites out of Egypt. Just, you know, kind of follow the bouncing ball. There's our plot. Revelation, meaning the spiritual reality that is the real reality, that all of this physical reality is kind of the shadow of, is God is destroying the reign of the demons. And he is bringing his people into the divine council. He's going to establish 
a priestly kingdom. He's going to establish the, the nation of Israel as the sons of God. These demons who fell are going to be replaced with humans entering the divine council and moral teaching. I'm going to be following um, the path laid out by our Holy Father Gregory of Nyssa in his work called The Life of Moses, which he, he describes it was, it was written to so, someone asked him for this. And he responded back and said, yes, I'll provide a moral outline of how we ought to imitate the life of the God seer Moses. And so I'm going to be pulling from that regularly um, to talk about like, okay, not only in the literal, this is our story, this is who we are, but also you in your day-to-day life. What, what does this mean to be like Moses? So we're going to try and do a whole bunch of stuff and accomplish a whole bunch of stuff. So let's see how that works out. We start with the birth of Moses, unsurprisingly. Uh, we have a new king of Egypt who does not know Joseph. And his desire is to outwit the Israelites, to be smarter than them. This is demon language. This kind of this knowledge, especially knowledge uses a malicious force. That's demonic language. Remember, this, this king of Egypt is a giant. He's one of these, these consorters with demons son of the gods of the nations kind of individual. He forces them into brick lane. We are immediately reminded of the Tower of Babel. And he commands the midwives, but the midwives deceive Pharaoh Bat. And this is something we've seen before with the people of God deceiving the demons. Basically, God granting power over demons to his people. We saw this with Jacob deceiving Esau. And here we have it with the midwives deceiving the king of Egypt. Moses is born. When Moses is three months old, uh, his mother and father are like, we can't keep this baby because Pharaoh has commanded that all the male children of the Hebrews be destroyed. And so they place him in an ark. They place him in, in in a wooden kind of container and they put him into the river. And we're like immediately thinking Noah, immediately thinking Noah's flood. We're also really getting Nephilim imagery because that's, remember, Genesis 6, That's we've got, like, the demon human kings are trying to, like, destroy things, and it's bad. He's placed in an ark. He's placed into the river. Water is very, very uh, commonly used as a way of describing chaos. Moses is placed in a safe container into the chaos. He kind of descends into the chaos. And we think of Christ coming into his perfect humanity descending into our chaos. Moses is is acting in participation with Christ's condescension later. He flows down the river. Pharaoh's daughter finds him, opens the little container. It's like, it's a Hebrew child. Moses' sister Miriam is like right there. And she comes up and says, I know a woman who would love to be a wet nurse for this baby. Would you like me to take him to her? And she can nurse him until he's old enough to live in your household. And she's like, absolutely. So Joseph actually ends up being raised by his own mother, but with the protection of Pharaoh and Pharaoh's household. So that's where we're we're kind of sitting right now. And the next time we see Moses, he's 40 years old. And he aligns, he is a Hebrew. Like he, him and he's grown up, With his mother, and he's kind of grown up in the circuit, like with Pharaoh's household, he has all of the, he basically, he's like another Joseph in the sense that he has become an Egyptian in in all these different ways. And he's 40 years old, and he sees an Egyptian and the Hebrew fighting, and he kills the Egyptian. It is very clear whose side Moses is on. He is already understanding himself as the deliverer of Israel. And he goes out the next day, and he sees... Uh, two Israelites fighting, and he tries to get them to stop, and they accuse him of murder for killing the Egyptian, and so he runs off into the desert. So, he goes to uh, Midian. Now, Midianites are descendants of Abraham. So Moses actually goes and lives with the descendants of Abraham, these Midianites, who know God. 
You know, they've got this this relationship with God Most High, uh, which is very different from the way the pagans. The pagans are worshiping the pagan gods and the fallen demons of the Nephilim. Moses is living with the Midianites. He goes to a well. He fends he fends off some some shepherds that come to the well. The daughters of the Midianites come. He gives them water. We've seen this well stuff before. He ends up marrying Zipporah, who is the daughter of Jethro, one of the priests of Midian. So his father-in-law now, Moses, his father-in-law is a priest of God Most High among the Midianites. And that's our big kind of opening bit here. And it's a lot to go in. It's 40 years of Moses' life all right there. What I want to focus on is not only how Moses is representing Christ. Moses is participating in the saving mission of Christ. He has been, he has come into the world. We see a, a, an exact parallel almost of the, the ruling giant is trying to destroy the male children. That happens in both of their lives. And we see him being placed in an ark. He's participating in the salvation that God brought through Noah. And remember, Noah is rest. Noah's name means rest. And Noah is here to bring rest. Well, Moses is here too. Israel's in slavery and Moses is here to bring rest. And if you remember, rest is this divine prerogative. God's rest in the minds of the ancient Near East. That's the main thing. Moses is here to bring rest to Israel. So we're seeing here already clear descriptions of how the Israelites are going to become divinized. They are going to be participating in the life of God. They are not going to be like other humans. They're going to be transformed. They're going to be transfigured into the sons of God, into the divine council. Moses is placed into the chaos and he flows to the king. And it's in his interactions with the Pharaoh, who represents the evil one here, that he's going to bring about the salvation of Israel. And we see that Christ does the same thing. Christ, ultimately, Christ comes in to the prince of the world. And his interactions with the prince of the world is how he's going to destroy the power of the evil one. Moses is also raised by his own mother, which is great. It's a good time. He's brought up in the Hebrew faith. And the way that Gregory of Nyssa starts to incorporate this, and he starts to say, okay, here's what our life is like. We are born into this, this world where the tyrant, and he's, that's how he's going to refer to Pharaoh, but that's how he's also going to refer to the evil one. We are born into a world where the tyrant still has power. Until the end of the world, the evil one is allowed to have some power in the world. We're born into this world with the tyrant breathing over us and the tyrant seeks to destroy us. And we are in charge then of how we respond to that. Are we going to join the legions of the evil one or the hosts of heaven? Those are our options. One or the other. There is no neutral ground. No one is being born as a casualty. No one is being born as an innocent bystander in all of this. We are either joining the hosts of heaven or we're joining the legions of the evil one. That's how that's that's our moral life. Gregorness also talks about how, as parents, we are bringing we bring children into this world with the tyrant in the world. And what are we going to do? Are we going to allow the tyrant to destroy them when they're young? Are we going to just hand them over to the tyrant, the prince of the world, or? Will we protect them? Will we hide them when we need to hide them? Will we build an arc of protection around them when they must be placed into the chaos? 
And the turmoil of life, this chaos of life that we see in the river drowns. It fully smothers the souls of our children and our own souls unless we're protected. Now, what does Gregory of Nyssa talk about as the protection of our souls? He refers to it as education, true education. True education is not the thing that we think about with like a school. It's not knowledge of of physical sciences. It is not knowledge of mathematics. It's not even philosophy. It's not knowledge of history. It's not mechanical knowledge. It's none of these things. None of those are the true education. Those are what Uruguayness is going to refer to as like a na- as natural learning or natural education. Sometimes he'll call it profane education. Um, remember that when we think about these kinds of technology, that's Nephilim language. It's important to remember what we what we do and don't mean by that. When we say that technology comes from the Nephilim, or that technology has this demonic origin in this way, we do not mean that secular learning is evil. We do not mean that math is evil, no matter how much uh, your student might think so. We don't mean that science is evil. We don't mean that, we don't mean that any of this knowledge is evil in and of itself, unless it's a lie. That happens, but philosophy, mechanics, math, language skills, science, etc. these are not evil in and of themselves. Their knowledge. And in fact, a lot of times it's true knowledge of the world. That's not evil. That's physiki. That's our second step of the stages of spiritual life. What we're reminded in this context is that it's dangerous. Knowledge is dangerous. Just like a sword is dangerous. Just like a match is dangerous. Knowledge is dangerous. When used incorrectly, it destroys. And, and the most common way of using knowledge incorrectly is to just be too immature, to not be able to handle it. If I hand a three-year-old a mat, a lit match, I'm a bad parent. <laughs> um, because they can't use it correctly unless I've taught them how to use it. But like, if I just hand a knife to my godson who's like two years old. That's not good, I should not do that. And, and no, one would, no one would accept me saying, well, but knives are not inherently evil. No one would accept that as an excuse. When he's older, when he's more mature, when he is able to handle it correctly, which is not just a factor of age, it's a maturity thing too. If and when he is able to handle the knife, which like God willing, he will be, it's not that hard to use a knife. Then I should teach him how to use a knife and I and then I should be able to give him a knife and let him use it and these sorts of things. When we think about this education, we think about this, edu- this, this knowledge, it's important to remember that what we're talking about is a very, very, very dangerous thing in the wrong hands. We should not feel free to just get dump information onto someone, especially our children. We should not feel free to just expose them to everything. It's not because knowing the way the world works is evil. It's that it can destroy if it's done poorly. It can utterly destroy if it's, if it's given to someone who isn't mature enough to handle it. It's like when I was talking about the commandments, we get to the commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. I didn't like just go into gross details about a bunch of stuff because I'm teaching children as well as adults. And that information is not appropriate. It's not appropriate for me to just hand that information to a child willy nilly, even if I was going to say true things. Even if I was going to make edifying moral conclusions of it, which like God willing, that's what I'm doing. There's a time, there, there comes a day, there comes a level of maturity where that becomes appropriate. And when I say appropriate, I really mean safe. 
when it becomes something that won't destroy. So when Gregory of Nyssa is talking about protecting our children, referring to this ark being built around Moses as he's put into the water, when he's talking about protecting our children, it's important to remember that he means education, he means true education. Knowledge of God, knowledge of the faith, and it's not just head learning, it's bringing them to church. It is praying with them, teaching them how to pray, reading holy things with them, speaking about holy things with them, so that they have a deep understanding of God as they grow up. Shallow fairy tale Christianity will not help anyone. It will destroy them. Abiding true relationship, striving to become one of the sons of God through the power of Christ's saving condescension, that will save people. It is of the utmost importance that we are not bringing our children or ourselves into the chaos of the world unprepared, or the chaos of the world will destroy us. That's what the monks do. That's what monasticism's for. They get out of the world because it's destroying them. And they pray, and they purify themselves, and they think holy things, and they fight evil thoughts, and they pray Fervently and without ceasing, they learn how to live a life in union with Christ. And then the idea of monasticism is, and then people come to them. They interact with the world again when they're able to, when they're mature enough to. And they're a great light and a great beacon of hope to the world. That's what we're supposed to be like. We're not so different from the monks. We are also supposed to be praying in our inner room. Finding the peace of Christ, retreating from the world, removing evil thoughts, fighting the evil one, learning about God and learning about God, not only in head knowledge, although that is important. I'm not downplaying learn, you know, what we think of as learning, but encountering Christ in the holiness of his church, in the Eucharist, in the holy mysteries, in prayer in the prayer services as a community and individual prayer, all of this, we should be bathing in this constantly. Or we should expect to be destroyed by the world. Moses was saved because he was protected by his parents. And Gregory of Nyssa makes the, the, the connection that either, well, on the one hand, we are also protecting our children, but in a sense, we become our own parents. We become our own parents insofar as we decide ultimately when we're growing up whether or not we're going to protect ourselves or not. And that's a really, really, that's the fundamental idea that Gregory of Nyssa is going to get into in the life of Moses is knowledge. This knowledge, and it's the deep abiding knowledge that brings communion between the knower and the knowee. So enough of a rant there. But that's our firm foundation for going forward and seeing what's what's going on. Moses sees a fight between an Egyptian and an Israelite. Paganism is at war with orthodoxy. And we do ourselves a disfavor. We lie to ourselves if we pretend anything else. If we pretend that secular learning, as it's typically presented, is anything other than at war with orthodoxy, we lie to ourselves. And again, I don't mean that the actual knowledge is evil. I don't even mean that the humans presenting it are malicious about it. The demons are doing everything they can to take that true knowledge, the gift of God. The demons are doing everything they can to use that to destroy us. The humans presenting that, that information to us are not the enemy. The demons are the enemy. We should be careful, and I don't mean careful like afraid, but we should be careful. We should be full of care. We should, we, we should care about what media 
we watch. We should care about what books we read. We should care about the kinds of conversations we have. We should care about the information that we receive. And we should care that when we receive it, that we are using it for good. That's its intended purpose anyway, is to use it for good. And we should care about the information we're giving to other people. Paganism is at war with orthodoxy. And even within orthodoxy, even within the people of God, Moses sees two Israelites fighting. We allow ourselves to fight with each other by the prompting of the demons. We allow ourselves to fight amongst ourselves over things that do not matter. And it destroys us. And it helps destroy the people of God. It helps the demons win. Are we joining the hosts of heaven or are we joining the legions of the evil one? Those are our two options with every action we take. Brothers and sisters, let us love one another. That's what the Holy Apostle John constantly is reminding us. Brothers and sisters, let us love one another. Do not fight. Do not punch. Do not hit. Do not swindle. Do not lie. Do not harm each other in any way, shape, or form. Do not harm another human being. Humans are not the enemy. The demons are the enemy. When we fight amongst ourselves, the demons rejoice at our destruction. Moses runs off into the desert. So I'm talking about Moses leaves the world so that he can be purified. He joins the people who worship God. He learns the true worship of God. It is a life of peace and quiet. Away from the chaos of the world. Sheltered from the chaos of the world. We do ourselves no favor by embroiling ourselves in the chaos of the world if we're not ready for it. Now, once you are ready for it, go out there. Attack the chaos of the world. Fight the demons. But an untrained soldier is a waste of time. A soldier who does not know what they're doing, who runs out of the battlefield and gets shot and dies immediately is a waste of time. It's a waste of human life. That's not what we want. You want to be well-trained. You want to be protected. You want to be sheltered. It is important to take time to, to be inundated with holiness, inundated with the love of God and the life of God and the power and the strength of God's protection. It's not wise to enter a fight if we are not yet purified. 40 years pass. Moses spends 40 years in Midian before we see him next. At 80 years old, Moses is on Horeb, which is described to us as the mountain of God. Whenever we see mountain of God, we're thinking temple. This is Eden language. Eden has the four rivers that flow from it. Rivers flow downhill. When, when we see the four rivers coming from Eden, what we're being told is that Eden is a mountain. Remember the Tower of Babel? Mountain. Remember the Jacob's Ladder? Mountain. He's at the mountain of God, Horeb, also called Sinai. And he sees a bush burning but not consumed. And he turns to the bush and the angel of the Lord speaks to him. And he, and he meets God. He meets God Most High. And he removes the sandals from his feet. God identifies himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of your father, the existing one. I am who am. And Moses is sent to go free Israel. Moses is being given this insight to know the Lord after being purified. Gregory of Nyssa says, actually, the one who's purified, the one who has some insight into the things of God, right away becomes a God, becomes like God. And the angel of the Lord shining forth from this thorny bush, I mean, we're thinking of Christ, the Theotokos is regularly connected with the burning bush as a creature who is not destroyed by the presence of God. Now, remember, 
if a corrupt thing comes into the presence of God, it's destroyed. The Theotokos being filled with God bodily and not being destroyed, if anything else, reveals to us the holiness of the Theotokos. There, there it is. In order to ascend the mountain of God, we must remove our garments of skin. Now, I'm not a Gnostic. <laughs> I'm not talking about garments of skin the way Origen talks about garments of skin, like we're light fairies in a meat prison. Not Neoplatonists. But these garments of skin, this, this, this corrupted human body, this corrupted human nature that we have, must be purified in order to ascend the mountain of God. That's what the incarnation is all about. That's what the salvation of God is all about. It's about redeeming our human nature, purifying us so that we're no longer in the garments of skin. We're no longer fleshly humans, but spiritual humans. Still physical, still material bodies, but spiritual, purified to ascend the mountain of God. I'm reminded also that this coming into contact with God, uh, every liturgy, what we sing after we've received the Eucharist, after we who are grass have come into contact with he who is fire, and he dwells in us and we are not consumed. We sing, we have seen the true light. We have received the heavenly spirit. And we worship the undivided trinity. The trinity has saved us. We participate in this moment every time we receive the Eucharist worthily. Moses is given the ability to do three miracles, and boy do they talk, boy are they about the cross. He has a staff which he throws down and it becomes a serpent. Dead wood bringing forth life. We'll see this later with Aaron as well. His hand puts it in his garment and it comes out dead. He puts it in the garment, it comes out alive. Death and resurrection. And he is able to take water and turn it into blood. And we're reminded of the blood and the water that pours forth from Christ's side. Moses is like, nope, I'm out. I can't, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing this. And so he's actually appointed, uh, his brother Aaron is actually brought uh, in order to be an angel for Moses. Um, God will actually describe Aaron will be an angel. Uh, he will be a prophet for you and you will be a God for him. And I will speak to, I will speak to you and I will speak through you to him. Aaron and Moses meet peaceably, just noting, not like the other Israelites. And they meet on Horeb. There's this kind of weird, interesting uh, point. Moses' son has not been circumcised at this point, And the angel of the Lord actually comes and is going to destroy Moses. Uh, but his wife circumcises their son, like lickety split. Um, it's just it's worth knowing that just kind of be it, it, just being born into the people of God, having holy ancestry, calling Abraham our father, it's not enough. We have to live as the sons of God. We have to remove the fleshliness of worldly knowledge of this, this idea, this idea that the, the primary way we know things is as physical objects. The primary way we know things is as a way of, of dominating the world. That's fleshly knowledge. It's not just knowledge of physical things. You can have spiritual knowledge of physical things. The same content can be both fleshly or it can be spiritual knowledge. Fleshly knowledge is when we know things for the purpose of domination, for the purpose of manipulation of the world, for the purpose of self-gain. Spiritual knowledge is when we know things as reflections of God, as the beloved creation of God. They go and talk to Pharaoh. They're like, hey, let my people go. Pharaoh's like, no, we know this story. It's interesting to note also that when this happens, Pharaoh uh, increases the labor of the Israelites and the Israelites turn on Moses and Aaron. The evil one despises us. 
hates everything about us. What he wishes from us is that we be destroyed. And when we meet Christ, when we are evangelized, when we're evangelizing, it is not uncommon for the evil one to double down and really bring on the attack. We must be very, very, very careful not to fight God because the evil one is attacking us harder. He doesn't want to lose us. He doesn't want to lose his hold on us. And he knows that he's immediately in jeopardy when the holy ones of God get involved. We think about this with our children. It's important to read the story of Moses to our children, to let them know when they are on our side, when they do understand the love that we have for them, to remind them that, hey, the evil one is going to attack. The evil one is going to try and get you to fight me whenever I'm trying to lead you into something more. Recognize that. Notice. We've got to stop. When you, and, and you can't notice these things if your mind is all over the place. This, this constant media stimulus is demonic. It is nothing short of demonic. It is there to distract our minds. It's there to make sure that we can't see it coming. We can't recognize thoughts when they're coming to our heads from the demons. We can't recognize thoughts that are coming to our heads from God. If we're constantly swimming in this distraction. I was just talking to someone today who uh, had visited a monastery for a few days. And they said it was amazing how after about three or four days at the monastery, they could think. That's how they described it. They were able to think in a way that that outside the monastery, they just, it's so much harder. And, and there's a, a large part of that is this, they, at the monastery, they were not inundated with this constant media. Again, to reiterate, technology is not in itself evil. The content you watch Online is probably not in itself evil. A lot of it is, frankly. Gossip, super evil. If you're if you're watching things on YouTube or news or anything like that, and it's just gossip, it's just drama, that's evil. Frankly, completely and utterly evil. If it's blasphemous, that's obviously evil. If it's gratuitous in some kind of sexual manner, obviously evil. But even innocuous media is something that the demons are going to try to use all the time and more often than not we're going to fall for it we should not kid ourselves into thinking we're somehow immune to this we're somehow better we're somehow so pure that it's not going to affect us we should not have that kind of confidence in ourselves. We should have that kind of confidence in God that he'll protect us. But that involves going to church. That involves praying. That involves praying at home. That involves constantly calling on God. It involves limiting our media input. And I don't just mean watching videos. I mean books, even holy books, even theological books or lives of the saints. There's a time and a place. Reading the Bible, well, first off, reading a theological work is not a substitute for reading the scriptures. It's good, but it's not a substitute for reading the scriptures. It's a time and a place. Reading the lives of the saints is good. It is not a substitute for reading the scriptures. Reading the scriptures is amazingly good. It is not a substitute for prayer. It is not a substitute for having a relationship with God. Knowing about God is not a uh, it's not a replacement for knowing God. Just like think of you know your spouse or if you're not married, a, a dear close friend. Knowing things about them is not the same as spending time with them. That's so obvious that it's 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 laughable um, to even suggest that we would think that. But that's how we treat God all the time. 
We constantly substitute knowing things about God for spending time with him. Well, that's jumping into the river without an ark. When we just know things about God and then we jump into the media, we jump into the world, we jump into worldly interactions, we jump into other things. The demons will absolutely try to use that. They will constantly, every single time you pick up a book, the demons are going to want to to distract you from God with that book. Every single time you open a YouTube video, they're going to want to distract you from God. Every single time you talk to another human, they're going to want to distract you from God. Nepsis is a fancy Greek word. Nepsis is what the, the early fathers, they refer to as watchfulness. It's being careful, being full of care, thinking about our thoughts, thinking about how we're interacting with things, keeping a level and clear head sobriety of the mind. These are all ways of thinking about what we need. This is kind of, we just have to be intentional about our lives. We can't run around effectively as zombies, running around, doing whatever, being thrown this way and that by the world. We need to walk the narrow path keep a level head about ourselves and not just throw ourselves into every passing fancy or passing desire that we have. Be careful, be intentional about how you live your life. This is how Moses was able to do what he did. This is how Moses was able to save Israel by the power of God. Is that he had be, he became the kind of person who is able to enter into the chaos as an ordered beacon of light. We don't see what happened to him for 40 years. This is a this is the long game. <laughs> we should not expect a change overnight. We should expect hard work for a long time to participate in our own salvation from the demons. Gregory Nissen reminds us not to be hasty to teach. Moses speaks to Israel only after a long course of purification. And the adversary strikes harder as soon as the freedom of the Israelites is something that they're pursuing. Gregory Nissen also sees the Israelites uh, in their bricklaying. Um, he, and he reminds us not to let the tyrant win. Don't fight God. Don't fight the holy ones who are trying to help us seek God. Don't turn to clay or earthly things for salvation. And the people basically ignore Moses. They, they want nothing to do with him. Despite the fact that God, not only has God promised to get them out to allow them to worship God, he has said, all right, I'm done with Egypt. I'm getting you out of Egypt forever. And the people are like, no, they don't really want it that much. They, are, they, are, they don't want it enough to fight for it. They want it enough to let Moses do it for them. They don't want it enough to fight for it. And that's what we're like regularly. We want holiness, but we want holiness if the priest will get it for us. If the priest will go to church and pray, we're content. We're, we're glad that someone's praying all the time. But we're not willing to pray all the time. Well, God does not save Israel. God does not save an Israel that is not willing to fight for it. God isn't recruiting us into laziness. He's recruiting us into the host of heaven to fight war with the demons so that we can enter into rest when the war is won. God tells Moses, I have made you a God to Pharaoh and Aaron is your prophet. Buckle up. I'm going to judge the gods of Egypt. And we get everyone's favorite, the 10 plagues. 10 plagues to kill 10 gods of Egypt. It is important. Gregory Nyssa's big thing here is those who live like Egyptians die like Egyptians. Those who live like Israelites will be preserved like Israelites. It's not an ethnicity thing. You've got 
people who aren't directly related to Jacob who are not harmed by these plagues. It is about how you live. It is about which side of the war you're on. We'll see this even better, even more when we get to the Amalekites. This is not ethnic cleansing. This is not a genocide. All of that is all made up. That is all terrible reading of the scriptures. This is about whether or not you serve demons and murder children or whether or not you serve God Most High, the preserver of life. It's also important, um, Greg of Nyssa brings this up, and we remember this about like uh, the flood. We get this constant thing where the Pharaoh, Pharaoh's heart is hardened, and God talks about, oh, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And this, obviously, that wording is a huge problem to a lot of people. Um, my favorite heretic, Origen, uh, actually describes this really, really well, and this is a big influence on how Gregory of Nyssa approaches things. Um, Origen has this absolutely phenomenal imagery that he uses. The same sun hardens clay and softens wax. Hebrew is full of verb types that are called causatives. I'm not going to go into the grammar of that. Just know Hebrew's got verbs that are like, I, not only like I carry or like I, uh, I, I approach the temple, but also you can say I cause the sacrifice to approach the temple. That's how you would say I bring something. You cause it to approach. Um, so anyway, think about this. God says, I, you know, I'm going to cause Pharaoh's heart to be hardened. That doesn't mean that God is removing Pharaoh's free will. It just means that God is going to be the reason Pharaoh's heart gets hardened. Well, of course it is. Pharaoh hates God. Pharaoh thinks he's God. And then he comes into contact with God most high. Of course his heart is hardened. He hates God. This is what we see with the flood. Humanity despises God. And so when God removed, basically God is like holding their destruction back. And eventually he just says, here's the natural consequences of your actions. And he, and he, and he withdraws his protection from the consequences of their own actions. And they're destroyed by contact with holiness. We bring our own punishment upon us. We bring it about and God regularly stops it. That is the mercy of God, is a constant force keeping the universe from destroying us by falling into chaos. But he allows that protection to be taken away in order to show us the consequences of our actions. How many times does Moses go to Pharaoh and say, all of this stops if you... Turn to God and let his people go. All of this immediately stops because it's the natural consequences of your actions. This isn't even like a weird manipulative thing like I'll stop hurting you if you make a choice. No, this is you will stop causing creation to destroy you and your people if you change. Over and over, Pharaoh is confronted with this choice, and he consistently makes a choice not to do it. And here's your ten plagues, and I'm going to just run through the ten plagues, and I'm not going to talk about any of them. But I'm going to run through the plagues, and I'm going to tell you the name of an Egyptian god that is, in a sense, judged by this plague. The Nile turns into blood, and this is judging the god Hapi. Plague of frogs, this is judging the god Hecate. Plague of lice, this is judging the god Geb. Plague of flies, this is judging the god Kepri. Plague of the disease of cattle, this is judging the god Hathor. Plague of boils, this is judging the god Isis. Plague of hail, this is judging the god Newt. Plague of locusts, this is judging the god Set. Plague of darkness, this is judging the god Re. And the plague of death, is judging the god Pharaoh, who is seen as the son, the embodiment, the body, literally embodiment of Osiris and the son of Ra and a whole kind of mixture of things. So this is how you avoid all of these things. Pascha, Pesach, the Passover. Take a lamb, 
skillet, roast it, put its blood on the two doorposts and the lintel, eat the whole thing, but eat it in such a way that you are ready to leave. That's Passover. There's gonna be a lot of stuff about Passover eventually, and I just don't have, I'm looking at the time, I don't have a ton of time to go over it. But keep in mind, in order to flee Egypt, in order to flee the power of the tyrant, the evil one, it is necessary to destroy utterly every bit of evil at its first beginning. To turn away from Satan in entirely. The firstborn of Egypt, the firstborn of the demonic influence is destroyed. And then the firstborn of Israel is sanctified. Within us, that means that we bring every single part of ourselves, the first little bit of it, to God. And we destroy the first part of evil. And we sanctify the first part of our of ourselves. And that is the path to salvation. This concern for even the smallest part. Handing that over to God, consecrating it to the Lord, and letting him deify it. Passover is eaten as a sojourner. And they despoil Egypt. They take all the wealth from Egypt out. This is the war. God is winning the war and he is despoiling the enemy. He is taking from the demons all the technology, all the gifts, all the wealth and power that they have given to the Egyptians to seduce them into worshiping demons. And he has taken all of it. He said, it's mine. The gods that you worship do not own any of that. None of it is theirs. It wasn't theirs to give. It's mine to give. And I am going to give it. But I'm going to give it to the people who are able to use it properly. It's the whole point. We'll see what happens to this eventually. We'll see what happens to all of this wealth and stuff eventually. This is God trying to give to the Egyptians Knowledge of the gods that you worship are not worthy of worship. They're not powerful. They're powerless. There is a real God. There is a real Lord. There is a real person in charge of everything. And it's none of these gods. It's God Most High, who has revealed himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and the God of Joseph, and the God of Moses and Aaron. They also take Joseph's bones out of Egypt, which is fun fact. I'm not going to go into that, but they take Joseph's bone out of Egypt like he asked. They then, and that's kind of this big kind of second bit. Now we're jumping into the third bit <laughs> for today. Um, they're going to cross the Red Sea. Famously, in the text of our um, of, of, of the, the liturgy in the Orthodox Church, the sign of the Moses makes a gesture over the sea to split it and a gesture over the sea to close it. And it's the sign of the cross. The Israelites pass through the sea. They bring Egypt into the sea with them. But when the Israelites exit the sea, Egypt is left behind. This is our baptism. We cross into the waters of death. We bring all of the demon baggage that we have into the waters of death with us. And it dies with us. And we are brought out to new life. And the demonic is not brought to life. Gregory of Nyssa exhorts all those listening to him, whatever you do, do not Save the enemy with you. Do not bring the demons up with you as you rise from the water. Don't carry, don't protect the demonic influence that seeks to destroy you. 
don't des- destroy the whole point of your baptism by giving yourself back over to the demons, by desiring to go back to Egypt. Hint, if you've read any of the books <laughs> of the Old Testament, this is what Israel will do literally for the next 40 years in the desert. They will constantly complain about how much they want to go back to Egypt. Don't do that. After they cross out of the Red Sea, they get to a spring of water that's bitter. Moses throws a piece of wood into the water, and it is made sweet and drinkable. They get to a... uh, There's 12 springs and 70 date palms. And then they get to a place where there's no water and there's a rock and Moses hits the rock and it gushes forth water. Gregory of Nyssa identifies this. uh, The the waters, the bitterness of life is turned sweet by the power of the cross. We are delighted at the springs of apostolic teaching, the 12 springs. And we are refreshed by the shade of the 70 palms the church continuing from the apostles. And we receive constantly the water flowing from the side of Christ, the Holy Spirit, and that is open to us only after we have been purified. So they cross through the Red Sea. That's our baptism. And we are baptized into the cross, into the teaching of the apostles, into the ministry of the church, and into the power of the Holy Spirit. They are given manna, bread from heaven. They are fed on manna, which is a participation in Christ. That becomes very clear, obviously, when you read the Gospels. Uh, It is bread that is given without plowing the earth. This is a sign of the Theotokos and the Annunciation and the Incarnation of Christ. We are also given the Sabbath. We're given a day of rest, a day of participating in the divine life. Six days of work, one day of rest. Six days of work and one day of rest. That day of rest is so important. It's this constant renewal of the divine life within us so that we can live out the divine life six days. We should not spend six days of the week destroying our souls. We should not spend six days of the week removing the divine life from us, handing ourselves over to the evil one, and then one day a week clawing our way back out. We should spend one day of the week deep in the heart of Christ, deep in prayer, deep in reading scripture, deep in good works, deep, deep, deep into the life-renewing spring of water from the rock so that we can spend the other six days of the week being that rock, being the body of Christ, pouring forth water, fighting the demons, working hard for the kingdom of heaven to bring it about on this earth, to bring about the destruction of the demons, and then refreshing ourselves. We don't just go to church on Sunday. We don't just pray on Sundays. We don't just read the scriptures on Sundays. That should be every day. But Sunday is given to us in a special way to deeply, deeply be nourished by Christ so that we can pour forth the Holy Spirit. We can pour forth the grace of God through our lives as the body of Christ the other six days. We're also shown on uh, in the manna that the Israelites are forbidden to gather manna on the Sabbath. It simply doesn't show up. They gather, they gather twice as much on the day of preparation. And for the rest of the scriptures, Fridays are going to be called the day of preparation. Saturday is going to be called the Sabbath. And that's like us. We should prepare for Sunday. We should not just suddenly, we should not be surprised by Sunday every week. We should not wake up on Sunday every week and be like, oh my gosh. I had no idea. I just, I didn't do it. I, I didn't get all my work done. I've got to, I've got to like do a bunch of work on Sunday now because I didn't. No, that's bad. You should have prepared. You should have prepared the day before. 
I tell this to my students regularly. I should not be lesson planning on Sunday. And none of my students should be doing homework on Sunday. None of us should be working on Sunday. We should be working on Saturday. We should be working on Monday through Saturday. We should be working for the six days of the week so that we are prepared for Sunday, so that we can set Sunday aside to be deeply nourished by Christ, to take part in holy conversation, holy reading, prayer, quiet, to allow ourselves peace on that day so that we can be filled with Christ not destroyed by media, not watching YouTube all day, not watching the news all day, not reading silly literature all day, not playing video games all day, not engaging in in lewd conversation or even just worldly conversation. It's not what Sunday is for. It's not for watching sports all day. It's not, it's not for any of those things. Sunday is for being deeply nourished by Christ. That's what it is for. That's what we should be using it for. Anything else is handing ourselves over to the tyrant. Is giving ourselves over to earthly knowledge, earthly education, a way of looking at the world like an atheist, a way of looking at the world like a materialist, not living our lives in any way, shape, or form as though there is a God. We become functional atheists who happen to waste our time at church on Sunday praying to a God we frankly really don't believe in. That's not good. That's squandering your baptism. Don't do that. Turn to God. He loves you. He loves you even when you live your life that way. He does not turn away from you. He protects you. He wants you back. He wants you back every day. Um, Father James is very fond of, of quoting one of the Optina elders. Repentance does not take years. It does not take weeks. It does not take days. It does not take hours. It takes only a moment to turn to Christ in repentance and to receive the love of God. But that love of God is given to us to change our whole lives. To utterly change what we are. To turn us into, to as John's gospel opens, to give us the power to become sons of God. To become part of the host of heaven. To fight this war. To save souls. And to join the divine council. And to rest with God for all eternity. The Israelites are brought into battle to wrap things up. The Israelites are brought into battle. God is going to destroy the gods of the nations through his servants, through his divine counsel. War with the Amalekites. This is the first of the conquests that Israel is going to engage in. It is worth bringing up, and I'll bring this up more when I read into like Joshua and Judges and things like that. Joshua is the one who leads this battle. That's going to bring us into like, oh, that's what Joshua is for. Again, this is not genocide. This is not ethnic cleansing. This is not anything like that. That's not even what the Amalekites are. The Amalekites aren't even an ethnic group. That's not what they are. The Amalekites are a cult of demon worshipers. They have a ruler who is one of the Nephilim. They are engaging in demonic worship, and Israel is here to put a stop to that. That is literally the goal, literally the plan, is to save creation from the demons, save creation from the corruption that was brought about by the fall. And Israel is not a passive observer. Israel is part of the army now, and they are going to battle because they are the body of God. They are how God is going to interact in the world. God could just remove the demons. He doesn't. That's not how he created things. It is not how he operates. He fights through us. 
He allows us to participate in his power, his might, his majesty, his glory, and his love. That's salvation. That's being the body of Christ. Israel in this moment is being the body of Christ. And so they attack the Amalekites. Moses is praying for them the whole time with his arms out and lifted up. And they beat the Amalekites. And it is through that, now that the Israelites are willing to fight for it, they have joined the ranks of the hosts of heaven and they have not turned away in cowardice. They are being purified. Now they are ready to approach the mountain of God. And that's where we're going to end for tonight. We have gotten the Israelites ready to approach the mountain of God. Through all of these things, through the, the, the drawing Moses out of the water and preparing him to be a leader for the Israelites, judging the gods and nations, freeing the Israelites, giving them the Passover, helping them avoid the destroyer, bringing them through baptism, destroying the enemy, bringing them through participation in the cross, participation in the teaching of the apostles, participation in the rock of Christ, pouring forth the Holy Spirit, eating the food from heaven, which is sacrifice. We'll talk about that when we're getting to Leviticus, and then fighting the war. All of that has, made, has prepared them for encountering God on the mountain, and we'll talk more about that when we get into the next time.